Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Let's Talk Dairy. Um, apologies for the change of time. There was a double booking on the account today, and I uh, had to delay a small bit in starting. So um, hopefully you will uh, be able to pick this up at some stage, um, either by watching it back on uh, YouTube or whatever, or maybe, as I said, in the tweet that I sent out earlier, listening to the podcast um, along with Emma Louise's uh, Dairy Edge there over the course of the next number of days. So... Again, a short one today, um, as I'm not going to keep you too long, but just again, a few timely reminders maybe for people um, who have been out on farm a good bit in the last couple of days. And consequently, I suppose I've seen a few things that maybe we can forget about from time to time. And especially given that we weren't out on farm during this time last year, uh, we may not have covered the likes of them uh, as we've been going along. So uh, I'll give... Um, <clears throat> credit to the people in Ulster Bank and Patrick Owen, my colleague in the Midlands. Um, what I'm going to be looking at here today is, is going to be taken from work that they've done in terms of an infrastructure booklet that was available at the Moor Park Open Day in 2017 and 2019 as well. Um, and basically what I'm going to talk to, to you about today is uh, roadways and um, water systems. So as I said, I've been on farm. I'll just uh, share my screen here now. Um, I've been on farm a good bit in the last couple of days and given the weather conditions that we've had, uh, obviously you can see that um, it's been quite warm and so forth. And as a result, uh, what I've seen is probably water systems under pressure. Roads are very dry now as well. So that gives you a good um, opportunity to examine them because when they're wet and damp and so forth and maybe uh, mucky, they, it can be hard to assess the surface layer. So a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about the requirement upon derogation farmers to respond to the new regulations and indeed all farmers to respond to the new regulations in relation to recambering roadways away from drains and dikes and so forth. Um, but this piece is going to concentrate on the surface uh, surfaces and the quality of the surfaces. So to be fair, um, I suppose there are some statistics here that I'll show you. This is kind of what we've been seeing, maybe just, just as I said, this is taken from the infrastructure booklet. What we tend to see on farm generally is a roadway that is coarse, probably is the best way of describing it really. And uh, you can see the tracks of the tractor on that there and how it's, it's uh, making an impression on the roadway and probably compacting that area where they are traveling. Sometimes there'll be loose stone depending on the implement that's on the tractor when it's going up and down there. Uh, although sometimes this can actually uh, compact in stone and create a pathway for cows to travel on. But as I said, loose stone can be very common on these areas. This is very coarse area along here by the fence line then. So um, as it hasn't been compacted and cows aren't going to walk on that too readily. And you can see here that they're not inclined to walk here either potentially because of, or they've created a track through here maybe then as well that they're inclined to stay on predominantly. And that's a good wide roadway there. And it's quite disappointing to invest a good sum of money into a roadway and see cows walk in single file along one side of it or on a particular point of the roadway because we haven't gone and finished the job to the level that we should have finished it. So just there's a, a study going on at the moment um, in connection with Patui and Mike Egan and a few other people in the, in, uh, the yard in here in Moor Park looking at uh, paddock infra roadway infrastructure and how it is uh, tying in with grazing, etc. So there's just some very preliminary results here. I'm sure there'll be more data will come from this. Um, I got this from Paul Maher, who is the student that's working on this project at the moment. So thanks to Paul for that. So the study farms that Paul is looking at at the moment, the median herd size uh, of the group of, cow, of the herds that he's looking at uh, is 151 cows. And from the work that he's doing and the analysis that he's doing, uh, he's given me a figure of 529 kilometers per year being walked by those 151 cows. Okay, so the, they're covering um, 529 kilometers per year going to and from paddocks on a day to day basis throughout the course of the year. Uh, and there's a, a, an, um, a calculation then that can be done as a result of, of the analysis that he's done so far to date that will give you, uh, like for a certain number of cows, uh, give you an approximate. Um, guideline in terms of the, the distance that they're traveling. So for 100 cows, they're walking 464 kilometers per year. So now that's going to vary from farm to farm depending on the layout, but this is just from the, all the farms that Paul has included in his study so far um, and that he has been to so far. Um, the figures would will give, generate this figure. So but whatever way you look at it, that's a lot of walking on 
roadways uh, during the course of the year. Obviously, from a grazing point of view, the roadways are very important. But from a lameness point of view, then the quality of the roadway is going to be extremely important. So one of the other observations that Paul had made in relation to the roads that they've seen so far, they're going onto the farms, looking at the roadways as well, is that the top surface layer is, is um, in poor condition in the vast majority of cases. So this is coming back to this kind of scenario. Um, and as I said, this is taken from the infrastructure booklet, it's not taken from Paul's uh, study. Um, so encountering kind of poor quality surfaces for the, um, the cows to be walking on. So the next picture I'm going to show you, this is the this is your ideal type of surface. You can see just a slight print of the, the tire track of a, of a machine um, on it there. That's a very fine layer of material that's been put onto the um, onto the onto the surface, onto the top layer. It does deteriorate in a road over time and needs to be updated. So I suppose if people have put in new roadways, they can often find that they have uh, very good surfaces on them. But over time, they do tend to to um, deteriorate and need to be improved as a result. So you can see here, there's a bit of scraws. They describe it along the side of the roadway. Sometimes that can interfere with the drainage of the roadway and we can get cutting it at beginning to occur here. But what will be very important is the fall on that roadway, the cross fall on the roadway uh, to ensure water is shed from it. If it's done correctly at the start, it definitely helps the lifespan of a roadway. Whereas if the fall is wrong and the road is inclined to hold water, or the, the road is carrying water for long periods down uh, slopes, it will uh, erode through that surface layer, take you down to the base layer, which is going to be a, a much coarser layer, kind of maybe two inch, four inch stone underneath is your base layer, uh, will wear down to your two inch stone, which is obviously going, not going to be all that comfortable to walk on. So we need to, as I said, in light of the fact that there's a lot of um, work going to have to be done around roadways uh, as part of the, the re environmental regulations, we need to be looking at the improving the surfaces as well. And one of the key things here is to try to raise the road above the surface of the field, preferably, so that the water can be shed off the, off the roadway into the field and across, uh, I suppose, how do you describe best um, Obviously, if we're shedding water at, at either one side of the roadway, depending on the fall or on both sides of the roadway, if it's, it's falling from the center, it means that we're not shedding a lot of water to either side. Whereas if it's been channeled and carried along down along the roadway and then going in at a certain point, which can quite often be a gap uh, into a field, it's going to do significant damage in terms of weighting that particular area. Whereas if, if the road is constantly shedding water, uh, the scope is there for the water to be shed off the road to avoid the damage to the road and not significantly wet the field either. So just some key roadway specs, I suppose, for people. Um, your roadway width should be at a minimum probably four metres, I think. Uh, the, the, the recommendation is that it's four to five metres for herd sizes of up to uh, or including 150 cows. And that any increase beyond that would say you'll be adding on a half a metre width for uh, every 100 extra cows that you'd be including in that. So uh, obviously, if we're saying four to five meters for 150 cows, we're saying 5.5 meters for 250 cows. I think the other thing that people often forget, and it's probably no harm to sit up onto a tractor and trailer, or a tractor or a tractor and mower, I suppose, or a set of mowers coming in for silage, and you get a perception of the size of the machinery that's traveling on the roadways. Um, slurry, slurry tankers are getting bigger, obviously a little bit wider maybe as well with dribble bars and trailing shoes on the back of them sometimes as well. And we need to bear that in mind when we're doing roadways in particular, because okay, well, the priority is the cow in terms of the performance of that roadway. We have to bear in mind that if we make it tricky for our machinery to travel on these roadways, it's going to be probably to the detriment of the road in particular. Now, there are some people that would say the, the better the roadway, the faster the lads are going to drive on it and, and potentially damage it that way. But I suppose that's up to, to ourselves to try to get them to take it a little bit easier on it. The other thing is the a wider the roadway, it is it will facilitate people maybe not necessarily sticking to one track. They can actually keep slightly to the left on the way down the roadway and maybe sleep slightly to the left as they're coming up the roadway, which means they're spreading their track over the entire roadway and it doesn't do as much damage. In terms of the slope, I suppose, um, if it's falling to one side, which is going to have to be the case where people are trying to avoid uh, dikes and drains with the, with the new regulations, uh, one in 20 for the one-sided slope, uh, one in 15 for the two-sided slopes. 
So where you are going to be shedding the water to the both sides. And bear in mind that that's actually going to, in, in this scenario, you're probably going to be looking at nine to 10 inches at the high side, uh, falling back to obviously the, down to your ground level or to your level of where it's going to be shading at the far side. So um, in this scenario, probably looking at six to six and a half inches at the, the, the apex of the road in the center. The surface layer, which is the layer that we seem to be missing on a lot of farms, um, as I said, it does break down over time. Um, but in general, to be honest, I think I see a good few roadways from time to time that are the, the heavy stuff is put in and layers of slig maybe might be put down on top of it and they're not compacted. Um, they, they break down over time, all right, but they, they tend to be coarse enough and there's not a lot of that fine surface layer put on it on, on roadways. So that's going to be another, in all money, two to three inches of fine material. Very important that that's compacted uh, in order to get it to hold in its place. Um, and to make sure that the, it, it's that there's no movement going to occur, which is going to cause it to deteriorate quicker. So getting the slope of the road right, um, getting that surface layer right, getting the fall, getting the water off the roadway is going to be very important for the lifespan of that roadway, okay? And compacting it then to make sure that it's a good solid roadway, but that there's a small little bit of giving it, going back to our picture here, where you can see, as I said, the track of the tire or the, the grips of the tire making an impression in it. That's the ideal surface that you want to be walking on. And I suppose what I would say to people is you take off your Wellingtons and walk along the roadways that you have at home on your own farms if you want to in your socks and see how comfortable they are. If, uh, I doubt very much that many of you would want to walk too far in them. And bear in mind then that there's no sole between um, a cow's foot and that roadway. So if you're they're walking on that and you don't want to walk in it and your sock, stocking feet, then it's unlikely that they're overly happy walking on it either. One of the other points that Patrick going off and makes as well is that the, we fence too close to the roadway. And so keep the keep the, the fence line back at about a half a metre from the edge of the road. That'll allow the cows to use the full width of the road. So if we again, if we think about it, the cow's head is obviously narrower than her full body. So her stomach tends to expand on both sides of her. She can only walk as close as she's going to get to the wire without getting a shock from it. So if the wire is too close to it, she's not to the edge of the fence of the roadway she's not going to walk on the edge of the roadway. And this contributes a lot to the buildup of this scraw along the side of it then because there's no traffic here and it doesn't get used as such. So if we do keep the wires out a little bit from the, the roadway, and as I said, half a meter here is the recommendation, the cows have the potential to use that full roadway then with, and as a result, they'll actually keep, minimize the, the amount of scraw that occurs at the side of the roadway as well, okay? Uh, and it allows for the full weight of it to be used. And that's what you want to see. You want to, you don't want cows. Uh, you often hear see people talking about the cow train on the way into milking and so forth, especially with the larger herds. Um, you don't want a, a single file scenario when you're dealing with a roadway. That's a sign that the roadway is not uh, doing what it should be doing. You want the cows to be using the full weight of the roadway, okay? So finally, I suppose the, the other, other item that I saw go bit in the last couple of days, as I said, is Unlike this water trough here, um, a lot of water troughs that were empty are, are struggling here. You can see small pipe coming into this one. Again, this is taken from the infrastructure booklet. Uh, small pipe coming into it, so the, the volume of water that was in the water trough was quite low. Um, and I saw a good few cows beginning to gather around the water troughs and the, on the couple of farms that I've been on, waiting for water to come in. Uh, and obviously, okay, it's been particularly warm in the last few days. Uh, but you know yourselves probably in the heat that we've had in the last couple of days, I find myself that I wouldn't be overly hungry, but I'd be extremely thirsty. So you apply the same principle to a cow. And I think there's often quite significant similarities. If you put yourself on standing on their four feet, we'd say, for example, just to put your, get yourself a bit of context for them. Um, if they don't have water, then you, you can see that they can become extremely heat stressed. Um, and that heat stress isn't something people would generally associate with Ireland. But yesterday on the farm that I was on, I saw uh, cattle going into the shade. It was so warm on the day. So, and I actually you wouldn't, it's not something that you'd actually see too often a lot, most of the time. Stock tend to bask in the sunshine. But as uh, we saw stock standing in the sh shade of, the, of a building yesterday in order to get out of the extreme heat. Um, so if they're short of water, then, as I said, heat stress can be induced as a result of that. And look, it's it's speculative, but there is some association with heat stress and embryo losses and so forth like that. 
So the only way that and cows generally have to keep cool is to either find shade. And as I said, that's that's a rarity, but to have adequate water available to them is, is going to be critically important. So if that's not in place, it's something that people need to be considering. And again, going back to two weeks ago, I'm, look, I'm advocating people spend money maybe, but in reality, there's a good solid milk price there this year. The scope is there that there's going to be decent returns available on farms and to make wise use of that money that's going to be generated when doing any capital investment, maybe because people will maybe be trying to offset a little bit of tax potential risk um, by doing some in investment. Uh, and this kind of investment is something that's going to future proof you in, uh, and also make your life a little bit easier from the point of view of it's, it's, uh, it's not nice looking down at a, a field of cows and they're standing around the water trough and knowing that there's little or no water in that water trough for them. It's, it's costing them from a milk production point of view. And as I said, there are associated effects around fertility as well. Um, so just to bear that in mind. So just the key requirements around water sizes, um, 60 to 110 litres per day being consumed, definitely 100 plus litres being consumed on days like yesterday and the day before. So that puts into context the sheer volume of water that they're drinking. Uh, the other thing that is probably daunting is that they're drinking 14 litres of water per minute when they are drinking. And this isn't a mistake here that this is out of line here. This is actually left slightly bigger just to highlight the fact that the actual water intake of a herd of cows, 40 to 50% of it is taking place within three hours of milking. So you could have, um, with, with the best will in the world, if you don't have a water supply that's going to supply the water within those three hours of milking, your herd is going to be short of water. Um, the trough size is a mistake there, all right? That's carrying over from the previous slide. That should be five to seven litres per head. And, and again, maybe that might be just a case of adding extra water troughs into the uh, into the into the field rather than taking out what's there and um, putting in a new bigger one necessarily. So in some cases I've seen where uh, people have added in more 150 gallon water troughs rather than putting in uh, one big 130 or 300 gallon one. And the ball cock is probably one of the major limitations on a lot of farms. Uh, medium pressure ball cocks are going to let in 32 litres per minute, which is going to cater for somewhere in, in the region of two cows um, drinking at the same time from it. Whereas the high pressure ball cock, which is your gen general one, the one that you're, you'll see or that you're going to get on most water troughs, we'll say the plastic water troughs that you're going to buy, they're classed as high pressure ball cocks and they're only letting in eight litres per minute. So a cow is going to be significantly dropping the level of water in a water trough where she's drinking faster than the, the pressure uh, uh, boil cock is letting the water into the trough. Um, and then obviously that has implications as well. That has implications for other stock as well. If they're drinking a lot of water on a hot day in that they're going to drop the level of the water trough. And then especially with the plastic troughs where they don't, where they're dependent on the weight of the water, obviously to hold them in place. Um, you often see maybe um, water troughs that can get knocked out, out of position as a result of going empty, okay? Final point, I suppose, is just on the pipe size. Pipe size is very important. Now, ball cock is probably, as I said, one of the major limitations. You can have a very good uh, water system in place, but if the ball cocks are wrong on the tanks, it's just going to limit the flow rate into the water tank uh, in spite of the, the pipe size. So I suppose we've gone from a, a period of time where we would have had smallish, uh, relatively smaller herds, where a half inch pipe uh, and the volume of water that was required wasn't as significant. So the half inch pipe worked uh, to a certain extent and people have maybe upgraded these to three quarter inches as things have um, has improved or as uh, herb size has increased. Um, but in reality, I suppose, the one thing that you have to bear in mind that if you go to an inch pipe versus um, a half inch pipe, you're actually increasing the surface uh, or the, the actual surface area of the pipe. So the bore of the pipe four times, even though you nearly fit one into the other, um, and that's creating a resistance to water flow. So the bigger the pipe, the less resistance there is to the flow of water. So if you're going doing a water system, it would be recommended that you be thinking about putting in a 32 to 40 millimeter main line and then taking your feeds off of that to feed your, your, um, your water troughs. And the other thing that can help significantly then with um, flow rate as well is to have a, a loop or a ring system so that it joins together again. It means that basically when there's water flowing into any trough, there's water in the system all the time and it's, it's, it actually can double the flow rate of the water system in total, okay? 
So just um, that's the end of that. I said, as I said, it's a short one today again, uh, 20 minutes. Um, I don't have any questions like that. Uh, if, if either of you that are actually tuned in want to ask a question, by all means do. Otherwise, we'll leave it at that for today. Um, just to say that next week we're going to be doing a focus again uh, somewhat of, on, on um, kind of infrastructure and managing infrastructure and that we're going to do a smarter milking piece. So just co uh, flow rate of cows, we did something similar last year. We're going to repeat it again this, this coming year. So um, next week, Padraig O'Connor from Chagas in Grange will be talking about uh, the process of milking and how people can actually try to improve that speed of milking. Michelle McGrath from uh, Animal Health Ireland will be talking about mastitis control during the course of the um, lactation. And uh, people from the FRS will be talking about the actual cow flow in and out of the parlour. So that ties in a little bit with the roadways as well, but also the design of collecting yards and how cows exit and so forth will be part of that. So we'll be doing that at 10 o'clock next week. We'll be back at the 10 o'clock time next week. The week after that, I'm going to talk to Francis Quigley from Chagas Kinkle Dalton about fertilizer spreaders. So there's a small little bit of maybe adjustment, maybe our checking of fertilizer spreaders needed in relation to people spreading protected urea. And um, the challenge with urea in general, not just protected urea, is that its density is slightly lower than can, so it probably spreads slightly differently. Settings need to be adjusted. So Francis is going to give us a chat, uh, a talk to uh, run down through that. Uh, and then finally, on the 22nd of July, Mas Tobrid from um, Moor Park here is going to talk to us about the work that he's been doing on his grazing utilization star index that was added to the pasture profit index this year uh, and how he sees that panning out in years to come. So I hope you'll be able to join us over the next um, couple of weeks. Um, as I said, back at 10 o'clock next week with uh, Padraig and the Smarter Milking event. Hope you can join us then uh, and take care in the meantime. And thanks for tuning in.